Dear Lord, we thank you for today. And we thank you that you are a good, good Father, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives and the lives of this church. Thank you for what you're doing in the life of the city, Lord. And I thank you that you're calling a remnant back to yourself, a people who love Jesus, who want to see Christ lifted up and exalted, uh, a people who are led by the Holy Spirit for the glory of you. And I pray you do that today, Lord. You transform us uh, as you, as our, just as our good, good friend. We can sit next to you and take information from our head and take it to our heart. Lord, that we can live the life that you're calling us to do, but not just from a sense of duty or a sense of obedience, but of a sense of a deep calling. Lord, there's a divine opportunity on our lives uh, to be molded in the image of Jesus so you can be glorified, so you can be exalted, so the world can see that Jesus does matter, that Jesus makes a difference, that he is real, and there's something of value with Jesus. So I pray, Lord, as we preach today, as we go through your word, even in the book of Leviticus, Lord, we've seen you do some awesome stuff already. We're excited about what you're going to do today, and I pray you preach your word, not my word, that it's your, uh, your text that comes to life, that you might <clears throat> empower and equip uh, and encourage people, even in things I don't say, just maybe what they see on the screen are different verses in the Bible, uh, that you transform them to the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus we pray, amen. Now, the Holy Spirit is clearly on a different page than I was going to be this week. So, let's take a track on what we've sung, and I want you to answer this in your head, uh, not out loud. And then when you answer in your head, don't be too quick to answer this question. The song after announcements, we said, God uh, is good, good. He's, oh, good, good. He's good. Do you believe that? And then we said, <laughs> then we said, uh, God is perfect, he is just, he is holy, there is no injustice found in him. Think carefully in your head, don't be too quick to answer, do you believe that? And then we just sang, God is so, so good. So this is not how I was going to start the sermon, this is way better than how I was going to start the sermon. And I want to ask you that question, do you believe God is good? And you can say that, yes I believe that, but I'm like, do you really? Because life, life gets pretty hard. And you have to answer these questions. What happens when life doesn't go how you planned and it's hard? Do you still believe God is good? And I think there's these fundamental tenets in Christianity that we have to hold. You have to believe that God is loving and he's good and that he's in control. Um, but sometimes it looks like he's not in control and it looks like he's not good. And that's where Christianity gets really hard. It doesn't do you any good to have a superficial religion unless it can answer the tough questions. Today we're going to be in Leviticus. And I'm excited that you're still here. You guys have done great. And I, this is exciting and encouraging that if we can get a lot out of Leviticus, how much more can we get out of? No, we get the same amount of goodness out of the rest of the Bible. So this is book 46. As you know, we've been going through the whole book of the Bible uh, in 10 years. It'll probably be nine years. This is book 46. So we're starting to creep up there. We're starting to get, you can kind of see that this vision actually coming true, which is really exciting. I told the team and, and my wife, was, I want a big party our last Sunday when we finally get done with all this. And uh, we can ride off in the sunset together. All right. Imagine if Jesus came back on the last Sunday. How cool would that be? Oh, man. Anyway, uh, how, how it would kind of stink if he came back like the week before. No, we were so close. Anyway, no, I'll be happy whenever he comes back. So here's the, the title for today is Consecration, Sacrifices, and Fireballs. Now, I just had to like, con if I had just had Consecration and Sacrifices, you'd be honking and shooing like already, just full out Z's coming out. And so I had to throw in the fireball. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but just to keep things spicy. Uh, so here's where we're going to start with this. And as you know, we've started with this every week, okay? And I love how the Bible builds on this stuff. I call it like the T-ball. Oh, this mic is on right here. The singer mic's on. Um, I call it the T-ball principle. So I, my son has this, uh, he loves playing um, handball. And uh, I, we don't really play handball in America, so he's, he's been whooping me. Um, but I've been learning. So uh, with this t-ball principle and when, when preaching, what I like to do, and other people do sometimes, is we have this, a t-ball set up on like a, a stand of some kind. And the goal is to get people to learn how to hit the ball. Oh, my goodness. Whoa. Don't make the bass player upset. That will be the worst. God is good pastor. Eh, sometimes. So anyway, the point of this is when you learn how to play baseball or let's say cricket, um, the idea is people have to learn the hand-eye coordination how to hit the ball, right? And that's the goal is how to hit the ball. And so what you do is you put the ball on a little, what's called a tee, 
And that way, the kids can learn how to hit the ball without it moving. It's just learning the concept of doing the motion, hitting the ball like this. And so you're setting up this point. That's not the main goal. The goal is for what comes later, right? So later on, when the kids learn the ball's coming to fast, you learn how to hit it. The same way is in the Bible. And what I try and do with the preaching is set up these principles that if I just gave it to you straight and just threw it at you, it hit you in the face. And you'd be like, oh, I'm not ready for that. How do I process that? So we set up, we set up the points. This is why I don't like it when people... Uh, like cut sermons in like 30 seconds and you hear this like really bad concept because sometimes they're setting up points. So sometimes I'll say stuff that's actually not true because I know we're setting up for what is true later on. And so I've been, we, the Bible's been setting us up for this. All right, all the, throughout the books of Leviticus, you weren't even aware of it. He starts off, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, you know, like, Kevin, why is that profound? Well, because we got the T-ball right here. I want you to remember this moment because we're going to come back to it at the very end. I'm going to ask you, do you remember how we started this sermon? Not with the good, good fatherness bit, but with this, okay? Now, I know that's a big ask because it's, you know, you have to go back like 25 minutes and if you've been sleeping the whole time, it's hard to remember that. But you're not sleeping yet. So at the end, you'll get the whole sermon. So it'll be really good. So we'll just remember this part as we set up that T there right quick, real quick. The Lord spoke to Moses, whatever, we'll come back. Now take Aaron and his sons with him and his garments and the anointing oil and the bull of the sin offering and the two rams of the basket of unleavened bread. We're going to be coming back to what we're doing in Leviticus. So you've, if you remember, you've been coming along. We've talked about the sacrifices. We had two weeks on the sacrifices. Does anybody remember what those sacrifices were? No, this is the question a pastor doesn't ask because you're like, am I making a difference in people's lives? What was one of the sacrifices? Okay, the sin offering, the guilt offering, that's great, that's two. Okay, yeah, so it's the praise, thanksgiving offering, that's good, three. The grain offering, yep, yeah, that's four, there's one more. The burnt offering, that's great, excellent, that's all five. I'm, hopefully you said burnt, I can't, it sounded like earned, and I was like, that's close enough. Uh, that's, that's the right, five offerings. So just to give a real, because we've been building to this week, okay, this is, God has a plan in all this. So the burnt offering was this, it was a free will offering that was, no obligation. You gave it of your own accord, and it was something of very significant value. As in like your, 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 you know, Joe, Joe Jane, the cow that you've loved all your life. And you're like, God, it's time, and I want to give this to you because I love you so much, and I want to honor you. So it was a huge thing. It wasn't like you showed up every week, and you're like, here's my big thing. Uh, then we had the, the grain offering, which was a smaller offering, or called the cereal offering, where it was very small, and Lord, throughout the day, I'm giving this to you. You can show up multiple times, here's some cereal, kind of like our concept of just little prayers throughout the day, little acknowledgments of what he's doing, little moments of praise as we go about our day, just acknowledging that that fellowship is there and that communion is there. And then we moved into the praise offering, the Thanksgiving offering, which is this idea of, Lord, I'm going to praise you and celebrate that we have peace. And this was a more significant offering sometimes. Then we come to the sin, the guilt offering. The sin offering took away the sin, but then you still felt bad inside. And we talked about this last week. You still feel guilty, right? And so God's like, look, I'll take care of that too. I'll take away the sin and I'll take care away the guilt. And we saw last week how Jesus rose again on the third day so we don't have to feel guilty anymore. He's taken away our sin and he's taken away what should be all our guilt so you shouldn't live in guilt anymore. So we've been tracking through that. Now we come to this big moment where God is going to meet with his people, and we've tried this before, and it hasn't gone very well. We tried it in the Garden of Eden, that how we were meant to do life, not like this weird reality we live in. The reality, how it was always supposed to be, was you were never supposed to die, ever. No one was supposed to die. There was supposed to be no bad in the world because God's a good, good God. And then Eve is like, you know what? I want some apple pie, so let's do that. And then Adam was like, that looks good, I'll have some too, and it plunged us all into sin, death, and darkness forever. That's not a great uh, story, but that's what, that's what happened. And so we're here. And so God was like, you know what would be great is if I could be back with them like we walked in the cool of the, of the garden and we just hung out, we just fellowshiped, and we were intimate, we were close, or our presence were there together. We weren't in this like long distance relationship. And so uh, when you come to the book of Exodus, you see that God had planned again to meet with his people. They were becoming consecrated. They were going to walk up the mountain. And God was there, the thunder and the lightning. They were too scared. And uh, they didn't go up the mountain. We missed that opportunity. So God's like, no worries. I'm going to try a third time because the third time's the charm. Now we come to today where he's like, let's consecrate the whole people. 
I'm going to dwell in the tabernacle there so that way they don't have to worry about my presence fearing them to death with the lightning and the thunder. I'll just be there in that little tent. Now God's everywhere, okay? He's still omnipresent, but he was going to dwell with his people so they could talk to him and they could walk together and they could fellowship and learn and celebrate and just have this amazing relationship. And so that's where we are today. How do we get there? So God tells Moses, here's the instructions. Tell Aaron and his sons. So Aaron was the high priest and his sons. His sons, he's got four of them, are with him. And the garments and the anointing oil and the bowl of the sin offering and the two rams and the basket of unleavened bread. So we see the sin offering. We see the grain offering. And assemble all the congregation at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So he's like, get everybody together just outside the church, basically, at the tabernacle. We're going to do this thing. I'm going to be with you. You're going to be with me. It's going to be awesome. Just like what I want right now. There's nothing more I want than Jesus to walk through that door and I can be with him face to face together forever. I love you showing up, but you know, Jesus, if I had to choose between, I want Jesus to show up. That's what I want. I cannot wait to go to heaven and be with him in his physical presence and we just be together in this intimate way. Like we can be intimate now. But I look forward to that relationship with him in, a, in, a, in such a real way. And so here he's going to show up. So they get there all together. Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded us to do. The Moses had Aaron and his sons come near and he washed them with water. So they get, in order for God to dwell with humans, there kind of has to be, we've got to get rid of the apple pies, okay? All the sin has got to be gone so that we, us can interact together. It's like God is the super clean laundry and we're the dirty laundry. He's like, okay, you don't put the dirty laundry into the, into the load that hasn't been taken out and uh, dried yet, right? You can tell I don't do a ton of laundry. Otherwise, that would have come out a lot clearer. Confession time. Thank goodness. Uh, I love Debbie so much for lots of reasons. Um, so in order, we have to have basically both people be clean. So it's like, let's get our outward clean. That's good, right? If we get outwardly clean, then we can hang out with God. Let's ignore about the inwardly clean for a second. As long as we're outwardly clean. Christians, we're really good at this. Let's put together a face before God. And then place the breast piece on him and the, and the breastplate. He put the urim and the thummim. You're like, what the heck is that? That's basically the way to pray and consult God. He would give them direction. So it's like, we're clean. We got God leading and guiding us. We're covered in prayer. Fantastic. This is going super well. Moses then took the anointing oil and he anointed the tabernacle and everything that was in it and consecrated them. So the thought was, okay, well, we got the priest clean now, but what about the building? If God's going to be in there, we don't want dust and dirt. And what if there's insects? Like, and what if someone who built it sinned? So let's quickly, let's get the oil. Let's anoint everything in there so the whole place that God's dwelling is going to be perfect. It's going to be holy. Sounds good. We're moving forward. Then he brought the bull of the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering. So that way, we could get rid of the sin of them. So if, if Aaron and his sons are going to be facilitating all this communion with God, well, we've got to make sure their sin is dealt with, their past is dealt with. So they do the sin offering. They put their hand on, represents Jesus. We talked about that last week. And so the bull takes, loses its life, so that way these guys could, could live. And you're like, Kevin, I'm not really sure why I showed up today to hear about this, but just we, we, got, we got to trust that God has a point to this, right? Then he poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar and consecrated it to make atonement for it. So all these sacrifices are going to be on an altar, but what if the altar is dirty and unclean? Well, we better consecrate that as well. Man, we're going to so much effort, but we're not done yet. We got more effort to go. <laughs> Look at this. So Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar Sprinkle on Aaron, on his garments, on his sons. Well, we've seen that before. And on his garments of his sons. And he consecrated Aaron, his garments, his sons, and the garments of his sons with him. So he's like, okay, well, they're clean inside and out, but they put on clothes. Oh, no, what if the clothes are not clean? Well, we better consecrate that as well. So we got the building, we got the altar, we've got them, we got their clothes, we got, uh, they've washed, and we've done all this great, oh, it's like when your in-laws are coming in and you're like, man, we got to make sure everything's great. Wasn't, wasn't that weird gift we got from them? And like, yeah, get that out, get that, put it up here. Everything's clean, vacuuming, everything's good because you, you want it to go well. You don't want anything to get in the way of that. And it kind of sounds silly, but what if there was something that got in the way of you meeting Jesus? Wouldn't you want to take care of that? 
Like what is in your way that right now is not consecrated and it's just constantly getting in the way of you being in a great relationship with Jesus? So we can kind of laugh and seem silly, but God does care. He wants to be with us. But he also wants to be with us not on your terms. It's on his terms. And he says, and you shall not go outside the doorway of the tent of the meeting for seven days until the day that the period of your ordination is fulfilled and it will ordain you through seven days. So what, what he basically says is, what if there's some disease or sickness inside of you that's not manifested yet? You know, like when you feel your throat got that little tickling, you're like, oh no, either I need a drink of water or I'm getting sick. Like, isn't that the worst? We're like just about to be sick and you're like, I know it. And there's nothing you can do about it. My wife says she believes if you just believe, you won't get sick. And somehow that works for her. She doesn't get sick. I'm like, I'm getting sick. She's like, believe you won't get sick. Actually, that sounds like prosperity gospel, which she doesn't, doesn't believe in. But I don't know, somehow. And I'm like, okay, I don't think I'm getting sick. It's just a little thing in my throat, drinking some water. And then the next day, <laughs> so I don't know how it works for her. It doesn't work for me. But the idea is here was like, well, what if they could get sick tomorrow? Quarantine them for a week. You all know what that's like? You're like, yep, I'm basically a priest already. So they quarantined him for a week. Just so much effort. At the doorway of the tent of the meeting, moreover, you shall remain day and night for seven days, fulfill your duty to the Lord, so that you will not die. Well, that sounds good. We don't want anybody to die. That would be horrendous. We don't want anyone to die. That would be horrendous. Now, normally as I'm preaching, I don't make such obvious gestures to the t-ball principle, but I want you to see how beautiful the, the Bible is and how great God is and how he weaves everything together in a story. And this is really true. Like, we, we weren't able to be around God in such an intimate way because we would die. Do you know that even your relationship right now that you have with God, you would be destroyed if it wasn't for the cross? I mean, how... How crazy is that, that you can walk in and have a conversation with God? Who do you think you are? How arrogant is that? You just walk up to the king and be like, hey, can we have a chat right now? I'm driving my car and I'm kind of busy, got the phone on, but I'm just gonna have a chat real quick on my time. And we can because of Jesus. Because he's perfectly consecrated everything. We can enjoy that intimate relationship with Jesus with no issue because of Jesus. For I, so I have been commanded. So this is Moses telling it to Aaron. Honestly, that was a little bit of a t-ball, but I wasn't going to do it all over again. Uh, now it came about on the eighth day, because they were quarantined for seven, that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. So here we go. Big day. Let's go. Leviticus chapter 9. What could go wrong? Then you shall speak to the sons of it. Actually, let me ask a question. How many of y'all know what happens in this story? Raise your hand. This is awesome. Oh, I'm so excited. That's amazing. I love, I love this. I get to preach the Word of God, and it's like a movie with spoilers every week. It means you need to be in the Word more, guys. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> then you shall speak to the sons of Israel, saying, <laughs> most of you all, sorry, I should keep moving, but uh, most of you are like, Kevin, I, I've read all the other books, okay? I just skipped Leviticus. Didn't think I needed to go there. Fair enough. So you get a pass on this book. That's fine. So take a male goat. Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. That's a male goat. See, normally you're like, you wouldn't even think about this. You just read over it. This is huge. This is like when my dad was teaching me baseball, and we go to the batting cage, and it's like, Dad, I want to put it on as fast as it can. Let's go. I can go. I can handle it. And, God's, and he's like, no, we're going to do this. He's being like, but this is a slow speed. And he's like, yes, but we're going to do this. This is important. And this is goat offering is very important but we'll talk about it later. <laughs> You're like, Kevin, I'm ready for the ball to start going out. Stop keeping it on the tee ball, on the tee. Take a male goat as a sin offering and a calf for the lamb, both one year old without defect as a burnt offering. So we got the sin offering, we got the burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offering to sacrifice before the Lord and a grain offering mixed with oil for today the Lord will appear to you. That's pretty cool. Now, if we were to extrapolate if we were to bring this from back then to now, what about those four specific offerings? Notice which one did it miss? 
the guilt offering. Miss the guilt offering. It's got the other four. So and what he's saying here is if we to take this to nowadays, if I have those four offerings, because I don't need the guilt offering anymore, because Jesus is taking care of that, and he's done the other four, but I can live out the other four in my own way, in my own life, where my burnt offering says, Lord, I want to give something of significant to you. I want to bless you. I want to praise your name for who you are. Like during worship, and they're basically heading into worship here with God, there's these four aspects. There's this worship that says, Lord, you are worthy of praise, even has nothing to do with me, the burnt offering. Like these songs, I confess, I struggle with these songs a little bit about, you know, the creation and the stars praise your name and the, the water does this and the birds do this and the trees do this. And I'm like, great, I'm not really a, a plant kind of guy. You know, no offense, some, some of y'all, I know you'll love your plants and that's great. That's what we, but I, it doesn't really do as much for me because I'm more like, but I want, I want to do the praise offering, which is God, what have you done in my life? How can I thank you for what you've done for me? Like, so when we sing these songs that talk about my story and God's story, oh, that does something for my soul. And we need both. I need to be able to praise God outside of my existential life and my circumstances because if God is good, then I have to be able to praise him even when my life is not going good. Because he is good and he's worthy of praise. And the other people, if you're in this camp and you're only praying, hey, God is great, but it's never on your level, then you're missing out on, on a, a rich, profound experience where God is rescuing you and saving you, and that worship is profound. And then if without the grain offering, well, I'll do that on Sunday, but the other six days, oh, I'm just living my life. And the grain offering says, yeah, well, you can have that great worship time that you have at church on Sunday all the other days as well. My favorite time of worshiping with God is Monday morning as I start my week. It's on the road. Drive and listen to what God is saying and praising Him. So it's all these offerings. And I think as that happens, then this phrase starts to happen more. Then the Lord will appear to you. God wants to appear to you. And He has ultimately the manifestation of Jesus, but also just in a relational level. That when I'm not living a life of where these, these offerings, not like, I'm not talking about a tithe offering, I'm talking about these sacrifices, these offerings of, sacrifice, of praise and thanksgiving. When, I'm, when my life doesn't have a lot of praise and thanksgiving, then I start to kind of push God out and Holy Spirit out, and I'm not able to hear as much, and he's not talking as much. Then when I'm giving my life to him, and that relationship is a focus, it's a priority, and then he starts to appear more and more and more. I was challenged with uh, this a little bit the last, I actually confess, about the last year where I felt like God was telling us as a family to move. Not out of Gimpy, so don't worry. Uh, but in, in Gimpy, move houses, which is incredibly dumb because you pay a lot of people a lot of money to go nowhere, basically. You got the real estate agent on this side, the real estate agent on that side, the movers, and then lawyers, and basically you give out all of your money to everybody else, and you end up with the same kind of house a kilometer away from where you start. I'm like, God, that doesn't seem like a good idea. But he was challenging. He's like, move. It just came up all the time. Move. It's time to move. It's time to move. It's time to move. And I really was challenged by this one particular uh, thing I saw, and it was like God was saying, hey, Kevin, uh, well, the, the, the thing I read that spoke to me was, are you giving everything? Are you surrendering everything to him? What is it that you're holding on to? And I was like, I am not quite ready to give up this money. And honestly, it wasn't just the money. It was just the time. The thought of packing up my house. Oh. Like, I like trashing stuff. But, you know, we have three kids. And we got, you know, things happen. And things just accumulate. Where did we get that from? I don't know. Like, somehow we've. And just the thought of all that work. I was not very keen on and God was like Kevin do you love me like what are you not going to surrender to me and I was like alright let's do it and so we started we started looking at houses started packing up throwing stuff out and we started making that process fix, getting the garage door fixed getting these random the holes in the wall that have been there for you know since my kid was very very little and, and a skateboard went through the wall kind of stuff finally getting all that stuff patched up and, and I was like alright Lord let's do this and then I all of a sudden I got this piece that said hey you don't have to move that's okay and I was like, and I wasn't like, oh, why waste all that time, all that energy? I was like, it was like God just really said, I just wanted to see if you would do it. I just wanted to know where your heart was. Are you really willing to get everything? 
And I don't know about you, but sometimes I kind of rest on my path. Well, God, I gave up my country. I moved all the way across the world for you. So therefore, I kind of think, well, now I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> God's like, no, that's not how it works, Kevin. You don't have one element of faith 20 years ago and be like, yeah, that's done for the rest of my life. And as we do that, the Lord appears. So anyway, they're doing these four offerings. We're ready to go. God's about to show up. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting when they came out and blessed the people. The glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Where God's presence is, is where his glory is. Where his presence is, his glory manifests. Then fire went out from the Lord and consumed the burnt offering. So they have the offerings here. They got the, the sin offering, the guilt, uh, not the guilt offering. They have a sin offering, the peace offering, the, the grain offering, the burnt offering. It's all there. And this fireball, <laughs> So I lied, fireballs were in the sermon, guys. And God just shoots out, consumes the offering. And then what's cool is if you go back a, a, a chapter or two, you see that God made a rule that that fire was never to go out. So God literally lit the flame, burnt the, that altar was gonna be on forever, his fire. Okay. His fire is gonna be on this altar forever. It's never to go out. And that way when people come, it's God basically consuming that sacrifice. Okay. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell face downward. Imagine if a fireball just came shooting out and you knew it was God, not just like some random weird guy with a flamethrower. Shoot out and you'd be like, wow, this guy really does exist. He really does exist. And he's here. He's in our presence and they see his glory. So now we gotta start knocking some of these balls out of the park. You gotta start connecting some of these dots. Is God good? That seemed pretty cool. It does seem good that God wants to be with us. Now we have these two guys, Nadib and Abihu. This is not Aladdin's monkey. It looks like it, but it's a real person. These are Aaron's sons, the sons of Aaron's. Took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, placed incense on the fire, which if you... I know you know this because you've like been in Leviticus hardcore since we started. You'll know that doesn't appear anywhere in the previous seven chapters. This whole idea of putting incense with fire. It was, incense was like with a grain offering, but you never just had incense by itself with fire. So you know straight away, that's not, I'm, no, I'm preaching to the choir. You know that's not what God said. And then offered a strange fire. Now wait a second. This was God's fire. Why do I have to offer a strange fire. So they're bringing something else that was not of God's, which he had not commanded them. So we've done all of this. God, we've done all this consecration, all this effort, seven days quarantine, the baths, cleaning the clothes, anointing the tabernacle, anointing the altar, sacrificing the sin offering for the high priest and the priest. We've done all this work. And in verse one, we ain't even 24 hours into this. And we got we got little sin starting to creep in. So what happens? And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Toast these guys. God is good. God is so good. God is holy. God is just. There's no injustice found in him. God, you are a good, good father. So, what? This is, this is crazy. Leviticus is a jaw-dropping book. You can't put it down. After this, it gets, slows down a lot, but <laughs> these two chapters are, you can't put down. So I think this really begs a lot of the question. I'm not gonna be here and pretend that this sermon is about addressing this issue because there's so much else I think the Bible's trying to communicate and we've been around, we've kind of heard a lot of this. But this is, a, this, is, this is where the rubber meets the road for someone like Aaron, who he's got this faith, he's following Moses, he's never really spoken to God at all and he's doing what God wanted him to do and he sees his two children just get blown up in a fireball and you're like, what? I thought you were supposed to be with us. I didn't know that would mean there would be hurt and pain from you. 
And this is where we wrestle with moving from a very superficial religious kind of faith to a, either a agnostic faith that says God's out there, but I don't want anything to do with him, or a deep, profound, life-transforming faith. It says, I know this is going to hurt. It's not always going to be fun and games. But if we believe God is good, then he's doing good even when there's bad around, when it looks like bad. And I think part of it is we live in a world where today we are so overwhelmed with God's grace, we have no concept for his justice. You know, like all of us should be roasted in a fireball every single day, right? I mean, that's what is just. That's what should happen because we live a life of sin. And so when we're confronted, when God is actually full of just, we're like, whoa, dude, that doesn't sound very, um, what's the word I was trying to remember? Inclusive. That doesn't sound very inclusive. And we're confronted by the, that God is all these emotions. And they die before the Lord. Okay, but no worries. We still got the goat. We still got the sin offering so we can cover the sin and we can move on. It was just two bad apples in that lot. <laughs> Pun intended with the Eve joke. And so Moses said to Aaron, okay, so he's, Moses is freaking out. We did all this work. He's like, I still want to meet with God. We didn't do it the first time. I want to do it now. Come on, let's go, please. Let's get this all organized before the day ends. It is what the, so Moses says to Aaron, is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. Those who come near the Lord will be holy. And before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. Then Moses spoke to Aaron and to his surviving sons. I know that's not supposed to be a joke, but it looks like a bit of a joke. His surviving sons, and, uh, Eliezer and Ithamar, take the grain offering that is left over from the Lord's offerings by fire. So the grain offering that got blown up and you got the, the sin offering and you got the, the, the burnt offering and then you finally got the, what's the other one? Grain, peace, thanksgiving. Yeah, I think that's all. And the sin offering. Uh, so they, they've got all those offerings by fire. Eat it as unleavened bread beside the altar for his most holy. So Moses is like, hey, look, you got to eat this, okay, before the day's done because it, the sacrifice has been made, but if you don't consume it, then it's not activated. It doesn't count. And what are you talking about, Kevin? In light of the gospel, Jesus died on the cross and, cons and God's wrath consumed his son on the cross. And so his his death has paid for your sins, but until you consume the sacrifice, it doesn't mean anything for you. So Jesus died for everyone's sins, but unless you actually eat of his body in the communion message, in the context of, if you don't know what we're talking about, believe in Jesus, then it doesn't do anything for you. Yeah, let's go. That's cool. Leviticus is cool. And so he's like, look, it's great that we're trying to do this offering the Lord and all this great stuff, but if you don't eat it, it counts for nothing. Even the demons know Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. But they don't want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior. And that's the difference. We must do that. We must eat of the sacrifice on a spiritual level. But Moses searched carefully for the goat of the sin offering. All right. So they eat the grain offering, they eat the burnt offering, they eat the peace offering. It's like, okay, that's all good, but we really need to eat the sin offering because that's the one that'll take away the two sins we just committed. No worries, that's good. Just eat up the cereal real quick. Come on, let's go, let's go. Eat, eat, eat. You like this with your kids on, in the mornings? I'm like this with my kids in the morning. Come on, eat the cereal. Let's go. We get in the car. We're going to school. Eat the cereal. Come on, let's go. This was me in high school. My parents were like, come on, Kevin, let's go. And we're going around turns. I'm like this, trying to eat and because my dad and I would go on a 20K run on Sunday mornings, and so we're just shower real quick, get the breakfast in the car, off we go, eat, 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 and finally you get to church. And then I would just sit in the seat, I'm like, oh, this is comfortable. And I slept. And then God was like, hey, Kevin, since you missed all your whole life of sermons, why don't you give them? He's got a funny sense of humor. But what are we talking about here? So Moses is like, okay, good, you ate all that offering, good, now we gotta eat the sin offering, very, very important. He's looking around, and it's, a, but he, Moses searched carefully for the goat of sin offering, and behold, it had been burned. The, the meat, like God consumed the sacrifice, and this leftover fire just kind of dribbled off over, and 
the sin offering that they were going to consume got burned up. So they couldn't eat it. This is like telling people, hey, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but you don't get to believe in him anymore. It expired. The gospel expired yesterday. Sorry. I'll enjoy heaven, but good luck. Like, and so Moses is like, no, we, we can't, what? And you just see, you just got this sense that it all started so perfectly. And it's all a giant circus now. It's just this giant fruit bowl monkey soup of, of crazy nonsense. It's all, it's all gone insane. And you, you look at this from a, an eagle-eyed perspective, it's zooming all the way out, and you're like, this isn't going to work. If my ability to meet God depends on my ability to be holy, I'm never going to get to see him. And so after this, you see God changing his strategy. I mean, it was always his strategy. Let me, don't get me wrong. But from our perspective, it looks like he changes his strategy and he's like, okay, forget this. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to make you clean rather than trying to make you clean to meet me. I'm going to cover you with my cleanliness that Jesus sacrificed is going to cover all our sins. He's going to be all the offerings for us. And praise the Lord that that sin offering was Jesus, so it has no expiry date. So this ends, and you just see, it just kind of ends really badly. It's like, what are we doing here? We have all these sacrifices. We spent seven chapters, this is chapter 10. We had seven chapters of sacrifices, two about the priests cleaning themselves. Chapter 10, uh, it was all useless. Ugh. Can't wait for Jesus. So I'll, we have one more verse, and then we'll go to our last verse. Why did you not eat the sin offering? So this is Moses talking to the two surviving sons. Why did you not eat the sin offering at the holy place? It was most holy. He gave it to you to take away the guilt of the congregation, to make atonement for them before the Lord. So you got two sons who sinned that are dead. The other two sons are slow eaters, and it costs them all their sin. I'm a terribly slow eater, and my wife is super fast, so it makes dates super awkward. She's done, and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm still on the fries. We haven't started yet. <laughs> anyway, so the chapter, that chapter ends, and we come back to how do we start the sermon? Do you remember? Say, say it confidently like you mean it. And God spoke to Moses. You for, did you forget about that? Obviously, you didn't because you remembered. That's good. What does that have to do with anything? Well, it's one of the key figures of the story is Aaron, and you see where he's at. Aaron has to make a choice of what he's going to do. Is he going to believe in this God that just took away two of his kids? Is he going to abandon him, or is he going to walk by faith and still believe that God is good even when God doesn't look good? And you saw him earlier in the chapter. It said he kept silent because God said, hey, if, Aaron, if you grieve for your sons, then you're going to be taking on their sin, and then you'll have to be thrown out as well. So they literally took the bodies and just chucked them over the cliff, basically. Just threw them out of the town because they're like, the garments and all, all of it was sin. Don't want anything near it. And so Moses kept silent. And we don't really know. Is he silent because he's brooding? Is he upset? Or is he going to actually walk by faith here? So look at this next verse here. That's a swing is here. And the Lord spoke again to Moses and to Aaron. We have never seen this before. God has never physically spoken to Aaron before this moment. And now he shows up. And Aaron gets to experience the richness of God speaking to him. And we see he, God does this again and again and again and again. Not every time does he speak to both of them. Sometimes he still speaks to Moses only. But he's invited into the inner sanctum. He's part of the the you know, the top, he's the top dog. He's the, uh, what does it say, the big cheese. All these in innuendums of, of what it means to be at the very top. He's there. And I love this. This is our story that Jesus was our sacrifice so we could meet with God and God could speak to us. Even now, he's communicating to us. He wants to be in a deep fellowship, not just a general relationship like I have a relationship with my second cousin twice removed somewhere in Alabama. Like, no, this is, a, this is a genuine, deep, intimate relationship I get to have with Jesus because of, and, and God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. So how cool is this? So now when you read Leviticus, because I'm sure you're going to keep reading, now when you see this, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, Aaron, he's tight with God. God is good. 
even when it looks like he's not. So here we are. We're four weeks in. Every week I get asked, okay, are we done with Leviticus yet? I'm just going to tell you, no, we're not. Come back next week for some more Leviticus. Let's go. We're doing this leading up to Easter, okay? Because all this has to do with the sacrifice. The only time you can do Leviticus, basically, is leading up to Easter. So I'm excited about Easter. We won't do Leviticus on Easter, so don't worry. We're good. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today. And I thank you, Lord, that you just have the profound gospel is just so obvious in the book of Leviticus, Lord, that there's no expiry date on the gospel. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you that you've been all five sacrifices for our sake. And I pray as we move forward this week that you might press on our heart ways that we can offer burnt sacrifice to you and grain sacrifice to you and the peace thanksgiving sacrifice to you. And I thank you that you've been our sin sacrifice, Lord, that that still matters today, Lord, that I confess my sin to you, that you want to meet with us and speak with us. But if my sin is not being paid for, my sin is not dealt with, if it's not going back to the cross, then it becomes a stumbling block for my relationship with you and for everyone's relationship here with you. So I pray, Lord, that you work mighty in our church, that you work mighty, speak in a very clear way to us that we can understand. And Because, Lord, we want to follow you. We will go wherever you want us to go. And I pray you do your work, your way, in our hearts. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.